A warm welcome to Diplomatic Channel and Millicent Walker. These are the highlights of the program this week. U.S. debt ceiling deal ready for Congress after long and bitter negotiations by Democrats and Republicans. While President Joe Biden says the bipartisan deal was a compromise, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy describes it as worthy of the American people. And Africa's largest population, Nigeria, gets a new president. Before that, let's check out the top stories in diplomatic circles. Chinese Special Envoy for Eurasian Affairs, Li Hu, and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov met in Moscow as Beijing heads diplomatic efforts for peace deal in Ukraine. Li arrived in Moscow on the final stop of a diplomatic tour that started in Kiev. The tour has taken him to Warsaw, Paris, and Berlin. China has urged both sides, Russia and Ukraine, to agree to a gradual de-escalation leading to a comprehensive ceasefire in its 12-point paper on the political resolution of the Ukraine crisis. The United States has announced sanctions on the local boss of the Wagner private military group in Mali, Ivan Maslov, over allegations of secretly trying to obtain military equipment for the war in Ukraine through its operations in Mali and other African countries. The U.S. accusation suggests that the group might be making efforts to exploit the abundance of arms in Mali. The country had seen an influx of weaponry after the fall of Muammar Gaddafi in Libya in 2011, as mercenaries fighting for the former leader returned home. Wagner is also accused of supplying Sudan's rapid support forces with missiles for its conflict with the Sudanese army. Russia has been seeking to expand its influence in Africa as it seeks new allies in the war with Ukraine. The United States and Papua New Guinea have signed a security pact. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken signed a defense cooperation agreement with Papua New Guinea, an MOU that will expand the Pacific Island nation's capabilities and make it easier for the U.S. military to train with its forces. President Joe Biden was conspicuously absent. Mr. Biden's no-show took the shine off the U.S. pact. In a meeting with Papua New Guinea Prime Minister James Marape, Mr. Blinken said the United States will deepen its partnership across the board with Papua New Guinea and that the agreements are basically a shared vision that both countries have for a free and open Indo-Pacific region. They discussed economic development, the climate crisis and the importance of continuing U.S. engagement with the Pacific. The defense agreement was drafted by the Papua New Guinea and the United States as equal and sovereign partners. Washington and Beijing are battling for influence in the Pacific and the United States is already playing catch-up after what analysts describe as years of neglect. <music> India and Australia have announced a migration deal as they aim to strengthen their economic cooperation. The announcement came after Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi met his counterpart Anthony Albanese in Sydney. The deal aims to promote the two-way mobility of students, graduates, academic researchers and business people. They also discuss regional security amid rising tensions in the region. India and Australia are part of the four-member Quad group, which also includes Japan and the United States. A scheduled meeting of the group in Sydney was cancelled last week after US President Joe Biden had to return to Washington for debt ceiling talks. India was host to key G20 tourism meeting in Kashmir amid heightened security, a move which Pakistan and long-time ally China have opposed. Hundreds of people rallied in Pakistan-administered Kashmir to protest arch-rival India's decision to host a G20 tourism meeting in its part of the disputed Himalayan region. The working group meeting was held in Srinagar, the summer capital of the federally administrated territory. This is the biggest international event organized in the region since India scrapped its special status in 2019. Over 60 delegates from G20 member countries attended the event. The United Nations Human Rights Chief has described the situation in Sudan as heartbreaking and made a direct call to the two warring generals to stop sexual violence and spare the lives of civilians. Fighting in Sudan broke out more than a month ago and has killed hundreds of civilians and forced more than one million people to flee the violence. The World Health Organization called the attacks a flagrant violation of international humanitarian law, adding that they must stop now. The fighting in Sudan began on April the 15th and was triggered by a power struggle between former allies, the leaders of the regular army and the paramilitary rapid support forces, RSF. Africa's largest democracy, Nigeria, begins a new dispensation with the swearing-in of Bola Tinubu as Nigeria's president for the next four years. He took the oath of office in an elaborate ceremony at the Eagle Square in Abuja. 
He succeeds President Muhammad Buhari and Vice President Yemir Shibajo, whose second four-year term elapsed May the 29th. The ceremony was witnessed by President Tinubu's predecessors, including the immediate past President Muhammad Buhari and former President Goodluck Jonathan. It was also attended by dignitaries from within and outside Nigeria, including foreign heads of state and government from Africa. In his inaugural speech, President Bola Tinubu reiterated that there is no provision for subsidy in the 2023 budget, so it cannot stay. He was also full of promises to Nigerians on tackling various challenges in the country, top of which is security. He promised to reform the country's security doctrine and its architecture, to invest more in security personnel and provide better training and equipment, pay and firepower. We shall remodel our economy to bring our growth and develop the GDP much better, achieve the GDP much better than we have today. I assure you, of fuel subsidy, unfortunately, the budget that I have glimpsed before I assume of it, and what I've had is that no provision is there for fair subsidy. The fair subsidy is gone. <laughs> subsidy can no longer justify an ever-increasing cost in the wake of dry resources. United States President Joe Biden and top Republican and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy have announced they have agreed in principle to raise the U.S. debt ceiling and avert a default. President Biden described the agreement as a compromise, while House Speaker Kevin McCarthy said it was worthy of the American people. The deal comes after weeks of bitter negotiations. Details of the tentative deal is yet to be revealed as it needs to be approved by a divided Congress. The Treasury has warned the U.S. will run out of money on the 5th of June without a deal. Republicans have been seeking spending cuts in areas such as education and other social programs in exchange for raising the $31.4 trillion debt limit. However, it is unclear how exactly a government program that provides food purchasing assistance for people on low or no incomes would change. To get more perspective on the issues, global affairs analyst Calvin Dark joins me now. Mr. Dark, welcome to Diplomatic Channel. Good to be here. So is June the 1st really the X date? Is there accuracy, transparency on how they came about that date? Well, according to the Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, um, June 1st is the date that she has set. Now, of course, um, there are other factors that could delay it. Um, let's keep in mind that I believe since January, um, the Treasury Department has enacted what they call extraordinary measures, kind of you know, accounting um, magic to stretch how long they could go. And June 1st is a date that she has set. Now, you do have some Republicans who are saying, well, you know, they want to see her math so to speak. They want to know, how did she get to this date? Is it real? Is this, you know, her posturing to get Republicans and Democrats, um, you know, to force a deal? I think the bigger issue is not if it's June 1st or June 2nd or July 1st, but the fact that the world's most powerful economy is on the brink of not paying our bills, not because we can't, but just because of a man-made crisis. So yes, the date is uh, June 1st. Um, even if that's not the exact date, it's still a very significant date. Now that the deal has been reached, what's next for the economy? Well, once a deal is reached, the most important and immediate thing that I think is going to be secured is that 
um, people who depend on government um, assistance, uh, people who have their retirement in the government, who are getting Social Security, um, paying our military, those types of um, payments that are vital will not be interrupted. Now, what happens to the economy in other areas, it depends on the deal. Because one of the things that Democrats want is for the debt ceiling to be raised and this not be an issue till after the November 2024 election. So we don't have to go through this theater um, every few months. Um, there's a Republican proposal for making it, uh, you know, just to next uh, March or April. Uh, there are even some who are saying, you know, let's kick it down the road just a few months. So it will depend on the deal with the United States economy, how it fares, because if they, for example, pass a deal, but then we're going to be in the same situation in four or five, six months, that won't really help our standing in the world and our standing with credit agencies. And, and if we backtrack a little bit, under normal circumstances, once markets start panicking, Congress and the president usually act. This is what happened in 2013 when Republicans sought to use uh, the debt ceiling to defund the Affordable Care Act. But it seems, you know, we're not living in a normal political times. Some would say major political parties are more polarized than ever. You're, you're right. And in just a span of a decade, so much has changed from what you described. And a lot of that is due to former President Trump. Here's why. Um, you may recall uh, a little over two weeks ago, uh, former President Trump very publicly said that he thinks that if the Republicans don't get the spending cuts they're demanding, that they should allow a default to happen. Um, he believes that would help politically. That would have been unheard of um, 10, 20 years. Even, you know, that's obviously what they were trying to avoid 10, 20 years ago. But to have a former president saying they should do it is absolutely crazy. And we have members, very influential members of the Republican Party in the House of Representatives who could blow up this whole deal. That's another thing that we have to keep in mind, that even if McCarthy and Biden work out a deal, They've got to sell it to both of their parties. And when McCarthy's case in particular, if the those who are taking their lead from Trump don't agree with whatever deal they come up with, they could blow it up or they could possibly blow up the speakership of Kevin McCarthy. So that is a different dynamic that we are dealing with that we haven't dealt with before. And as much as we look at, you know, if things become really bad and it really blows up, what are the countries, apart from the sectors you've mentioned in the U.S. that could be at risk, what are the countries around the world do you think would suffer from this? Well, I think that countries, for example, that we have partnerships with, um, be it uh, economic partnerships or foreign aid, I know that if there is a, if we don't reach a deal, that one of the areas that they call discretionary spending that may have to be paused and, you know, the government would be writing IOUs to people might be some of those programs with foreign countries. Um, we obviously also are aware that there are many countries that peg their currency to the dollar and depend on the U.S economy um, for the welfare of their economy. So I think that those countries will be at particular risk. And just in general, when you have the largest economy in the world um, toying with default, it does not do good things at all for the U.S. stock market or the global markets. Indeed. And some say it would also affect some countries in Africa. Yes, definitely would. And I think that's going to hit particularly hard, one, on the programs and initiatives that African countries have with the U.S. that involve payments of money, but then also just the ripple effect. We saw the ripple effect across um, Africa after the economic downturn from COVID. So imagine what will happen with this. And it's just such a shame because unlike with COVID and the pandemic, this is uh, manufactured. This is created. This is not this does not have to happen this way, yet for political reasons it is. But we are not looking at a recession, are we? I hope not. That's where, you know, we're already recovering. And it's interesting that on the one hand, Republicans are making their argument for 2024 that the Biden economy is horrible, that he hasn't bounced back from COVID pandemic um, uh, economic lows, the recession or near recession that that brought on. Yet they are um, at 
the border of defaulting, which would do even more damage to the economy they say is already failing. So um, I see that a recession, they say, could be um, provoked if we have a default or get close to it. I just really hope that's not the case. Fingers crossed it isn't. Thanks, Calvin Doc, for talking to us. Thank you. Let's take a break now. Diplomatic Channel continues in a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back. The head of Russia's Wagner mercenary group has announced that its forces have started withdrawing from the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut. Evgeny Prigozhin had vowed to transfer control of the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut to the Russian army by June the 1st. He had laid claim to have captured Bakhmut, but Kyiv says it is still in control of parts of the city. Though Ukrainian troops are still advancing on the outskirts of Bakhmut, Bakhmut was previously known as Atimovsk in honor of a Soviet revolutionary before Ukraine renamed it. Senior Ukrainian Analyst, International Crisis Group, Mr. Simon Schlegel, thank you for joining me on Diplomatic Channel. Now, there have been conflicting claims by Russia and Ukraine over the status of Bakhmut in recent days. What's the true picture? I think there's no two ways about it. Most of the built-up area of the city of Bakhmut is now under the control of Wagner forces. It has been a trend for throughout the winter and spring that Wagner forces have progressed throughout the city of Bakhmut. And I think what was important for the Ukrainians in all this time is not so much to keep uh, Bakhmut at all prices, but to inflict as much, as many costs on the Russians and on Wagner as possible. And in the process, they have also managed to avoid encirclement. And in the first half of May, they have had a couple of military successes around the flanks of Bakhmut so that they have now uh, successfully avoided encirclement and make it very hard for the Russians or Wagner, whoever will control the city in the next couple of months, to break, to break out of Bakhmut and to make any further progress uh, out of Bakhmut into the rest of the Donbas area that the Russians claim to have annexed. So when analysts say Bakhmut is of little significance to Moscow uh, and its capture would, be, uh, would not be a symbolic victory, uh, do you agree? I would say it is a symbolic victory. It is indeed not very likely to change the military balance very much because uh, the rest of the Donbas region, the rest of Donetsk region, which the Russians have said is their war aim to capture, contains another four or five cities in similar size as Bakhmut, but better defended, where the Ukrainians have much better uh, defense positions. And as the Russians have scaled back their war aims from first capturing Kiev to then uh, exchanging the government in Kiev to then just uh, capturing the east of the country, as they've progressively scaled back their war aims, the capturing of Bakhmut has taken on a life of its own as a symbolic uh, as a symbolic gain, as a symbol for the Russians still having the capability to make progress on the map. And they have paid a very huge price for it and very likely now have uh, de de depleted their forward capabilities for a long time. So it's a very high price for this symbolic value. And it's not clear that they can ma make any military progress from here on, which is probably also the reason why um, they make it so much about the symbolism of it rather than the military prospects. What are your thoughts of especially the role that Wagner, the mercenary group, has to play? Um, we've heard Yevgeny Prigozhin, who's vowing to hand over Bakhmut to the Russian army, um, you know, saying that the transfer is on the way. Yes, it's likely that uh, Prigozhin will have to rest and rotate his troops. They have uh, been very, they have paid a very high price in men and also in in weaponry, and they will probably have to withdraw from Bakhmut to regain any uh, capability to take part in uh, offensive uh, actions again. So it's likely that they withdraw and that they put in Russian troops, who then will mainly concentrate on defending Bakhmut and not losing more of it to the Ukrainians. Uh, whereas uh, the Ukrainians will try to, to use their newly gained long-range capabilities to make life in the Russian rear a nightmare to target any places where the Russian 
or Wagner forces concentrate their troops where they store ammunition or fuel to make it very hard for them to, to go into the attack again. And uh, it's not only the high price that Wagner has paid in uh, dead soldiers and in lost weapons, but also the campaign in Bakhmut has exposed deep running deficiencies in the Russian uh, army and deep running conflicts between the Wagner groups and the Russian Ministry of Defense. Uh, all of these are factors that the Ukrainians will try to exploit and will try to use against the Russians as they are looking for soft spots and gaps in their defensive lines to exploit and to retake more of their territory. And perhaps that's why the Wagner chief has also somewhat criticized uh, Russia, saying that they could face a revolution similar to that of 1917 and lose the conflict uh, in Ukraine unless they are serious about fighting the war. Um, perhaps one question to ask is, is Wagner's characterization a possibility? Well, Yevgeny Prigozhin is not a sociologist, and uh, revolutions are very hard to predict. He is a disinformation professional. He thrives on chaos and disinformation and confusion. And uh, he has taken on the very useful role for the Kremlin to say things that the Kremlin itself cannot say without losing its face. One of those things is saying that this uh, Russian invasion is not going as planned, that the price they're paying is much too high, that they will unlikely make any further progress uh, in the near future. And uh, he's very useful in uh, being the bearer of this very bad message for Russia and for preparing the Russian public for a very long and very costly campaign. The Kremlin itself doesn't have uh, the possibility to say that without losing face. And Belgoshin is very useful. And I would much more see it in, in, uh, in this aspect of him predicting a revolution than the actual potential for this, because there are very few platforms now for mass dissent. There is uh, most people who are actually opposed to this war have left the country or are in prison. And the, the only people who can openly criticize the government are people like Evgeny Prigozhin, who are more hawkish than the government itself about the war, who call for uh, harsher uh, military tactics, for carpet bombing of Ukrainian cities, for the use of nuclear weapons even. Uh, these are people who uh, can openly challenge the government and the government in uh, Moscow then looks outright reasonable when compared to that. Let's look at the United States, which has strongly condemned the agreement for Russia to deploy tactical nuclear weapons to Belarus, but had not seen any reason to adjust. Is there any indication that Russia is preparing to use nuclear weapons? And this is through Belarus. I think the, the mere fact that they are stationing these tactical nuclear weapons in the territory of Belarus uh, by itself doesn't indicate that they are preparing to actually use them in Ukraine, but it definitely does indicate that they will want to use them as a threat to project more nuclear threats in the future. And uh, it's very unlikely that they will use them on the battlefield at the moment because that would really escalate the conflict. It would bring the Russians quite certainly into a direct confrontation with the United States and NATO forces. They have painstakingly tried to avoid this so far in the war. And uh, now that they're weakened so much, they would have real trouble to hold up in a, a direct confrontation with NATO troops. So I think that the stationing of nuclear weapons in Belarus is much more about Belarus than about Ukraine. It's a way of undermining the sovereignty of that neighboring country further when uh, there should be a succession crisis in Belarus. Uh, the Belarusian leader, uh, Lukashenko, is uh, aging. He has had, he's been hospitalized in, in uh, recent days. There is no uh, clear mechanism of uh, fair uh, elections in Belarus. So it's very likely that there will be a succession crisis uh, in the future and that Russia will try to use that to uh, integrate Belarus more tightly into the Russian zone of influence and the stationing of tactical nuclear weapons there would be a very good excuse to intervene militarily should there be mass protests of the kind we've seen them three years ago in the summer of 2020. And Simon, you're a member of the International Crisis Group. I mean, what are the discussions that you have over this conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine and, you know, some of the solutions that you think is in the best interest of uh, the country and the world so that the war can end? 
it's very important that we uh, keep supporting Ukraine, that Ukraine does have a chance to regain more of its territory, uh, even with the use of force, but that at the same time, we do this in such a way that it doesn't escalate the conflict. What would be very uh, bad, for example, is uh, openly calling for regime change in Moscow. So uh, uh, leaders in the Kremlin must uh, always see a possibility for themselves to come out of a losing conflict and still stay in power. Um, that's That shouldn't be the aim of, of this war, regime change in Moscow. That should be uh, something that the, that the Russian population deals with. It's very important to uh, to deal with the consequences as they occur now. That includes, for example, managing uh, the global food price crisis through uh, initiatives like the the Black Sea Grain Initiative. It's very important to manage the humanitarian and refugee crisis in uh, Ukraine and throughout Europe. Uh, but uh, now calling for direct negotiations uh, between Russia and Ukraine is probably not realistic as uh, the Ukrainian side has made it clear that they will not negotiate territory. And the Russian side has also made it clear uh, that, that they will claim this territory uh, further. So it's, it's really important to keep diplomatic channels open and to use them for the exchange of prisoners, for um, softening the humanitarian impact and for initiatives like the Black Sea Grain Deal. But uh, probably hanging our expectations too high that there is um, a close uh, um, end to this conflict, a negotiated end to this conflict uh, is probably not, um, it, it would be a disservice because it's not realistic. I would like to thank uh, Simon Schlegel, Senior Ukraine Analyst, International Crisis Group. Thanks for joining us on Diplomatic Channel. Thanks for having me. And that's Diplomatic Channel this week. You can watch this and other episodes again on our YouTube channel, forward slash channels web, and our channels playlist. I'm Melissa Antwonka. I'll see you next time.